Hey everybody, I'm uh, Toby Knaub from Mesosphere. Um, and I want to I wanna talk about um, Mesos and you know, some of the long-lived uh, service schedulers like Marathon and Aurora, uh, kind of from a DevOps perspective. Like, why should you care about this um, if, you're doing, if you're an SRE or a DevOps? And um, this is based on, on my own experience um, doing SRE at Airbnb, which is what I did before uh, Mesosphere. And um, I'm, I'm basically going to you know, first kind of talk a little bit about what the environment there was like, you know, how, how software got written, and what the challenges were. And, and basically go through a number of challenges that we, you know, we were facing and um, how Mesos and um, you know, Marathon or Aurora can, can solve those challenges. Um, so you know, a lot of these problems, when we ran into them, that was actually before Airbnb um, was, was using Mesos. Um, as many of you guys know, they, they're using it heavily for data infrastructure. Um, but this was way before then. And so they went a different tack. They're not using Mesos for that kind of stuff. But uh, you know, in retrospect, you could, you could solve a lot of these problems with Mesos and, and Marathon. So just to kind of, um, kind of um, set the stage, you know, what, was the, what was the environment like at Airbnb? So Airbnb is, is still like a super fast growing company. They saw hockey stick growth from pretty early on. So, you know, lots of users flooding the site all the time, lots of traffic. Um, and that also translated to growth in the engineering team. There was, you know, lots of new people getting hired and, um, and writing code and, and wanting to deploy code. Um, Airbnb runs entirely in the cloud on AWS. And um, it became a polyglot environment after, you know, just a few years. They started as a monolithic Rails application talking to a MySQL database. But, um, you know, it became a service-oriented architecture. You know, they wrote search services and, and other things. Um, they also started acquiring companies that you know brought in a different technology stack. So you know, there were many apps to deploy and, and run. Um, another thing that's uh, that's important here is um, Airbnb's culture was um, kind of um, you know everybody deploys all the time. Um, you know, every developer could deploy to production at any point in time. It was done a lot, you know, up to like dozens of times a day sometimes. And um, it was kind of baked into their product development process, you know, to release features early and test them, uh, test them early and stuff. So it was very important that this worked and, and worked really well. Um, you know, during, during that crazy growth and, and you know, um, with all the new people starting. So, and it was, it was clear pretty quickly that um, off-the-shelf tools for doing this kind of stuff didn't work. Um, there was all sorts of challenges uh, with those tools, and I'm going to talk about those. So there's some guiding principles that kind of, um, you know, we followed and um, that I think, you know, made it into or, or reflected in Mesos and, and Marathon. Um, so as an SRE, you want to automate all the things you want. Um, and, and it's basically kind of out of self-interest because you just don't want to get paged. That sucks. You know, so automate as much as you can. Um, and you know, basically let all the prob as mu many problems as you can, let them just solve themselves. And if you want to automate a lot of things, um, you, you need to monitor everything because you need, really need to really understand um, what the problem is and what exactly happens so you can you know, have an, an appropriate automatic response to that. Um, another thing that was really important, you know, like I said, um, everybody deployed all the time. So it was really important that everybody had direct access to the cluster, to the hardware resources, that there wasn't like a you know, hardware ordering process or whatever that you know, people could just run their app whenever they felt like it. Um, and the mission of the SRE team was kind of um, you know, to build self-serve tools that you know, the devs can use uh, to run their apps. So let's, let's start with some of the challenges. Um, one big challenge is. Um, what we like to call snowflakes. And what that really means is that you often end up um, having you know, very unique machines in, in your data center. And you know, just like snowflakes, they're all unique. And they can be unique in very different ways. Um, this can be like unique hardware configurations. Um, and um, the cloud, or you know, if you're running on VMs in general, um, actually makes that problem a little bigger because you can, you know, you can pick different VM sizes. They all have different characteristics. And, um, you know, you end up with, with more kind of unique configurations. 
Um, another thing that happens commonly is like you have these, these singleton machines, like there's this one special machine that runs, for example, your central cron tab that runs all your data analytics jobs. Um, kind of see that everywhere. And, and, and so these, these things are, you know, snowflakes, they need, they need special care and attention. Um, and this is a problem, especially in the cloud, because if, if this machine fails, the, you know, in the cloud, you can't just go there and try to recover this machine, you know, try to replace the disk or whatever. Um, the workflow there is let you yeah, throw it away and you need to bring up a new one. Um, so that's really challenging. It's like, you know, it's a manual process. Someone has to go in and do that, replace this, this particular machine and like put the right configuration on it and, and whatever. Um, so it's just a lot, of, a lot of manual work. So how do you solve this? Um, I think the solution is to really, you know, think about resource and, and not machines which is exactly the model that, that Mesos uses. Um, your data center becomes a pool of resources. Individual machines kind of disappear. Um, and, and the apps, you know, they consume the resources. They say how many resources they want, but they're not bound to individual machines. You're not, you know, you're not, the interface is not that you're starting service A on machine B. You just launch it into this pool of resources. Um, so that helps with getting rid of the snowflakes because all of a sudden, all the machines in your, in your cluster look the same and, um, because they're just all part of the same pool. And that re really reduces complexity for ops. There's only one type of machine that you need to maintain. Um, it also means that you know, now your workloads can move around. You no longer have this requirement that this app needs to run on a special machine. They're all the same. They can move around. And, and that allows us to do some, some other things that I'm, that I'm going to talk about later. Another big challenge is kind of um, right-sizing of resources. So, you know, the industry-wide average CPU utilization on, in, in data centers, even in the cloud, is, is somewhere between 10 and 15 percent. That's really, really low. That's a lot of waste. Um, and especially when you're running in the cloud, you know, you're paying for your servers every month. So that's, that's you know, OPEX that you have every month, and a lot of it is going to waste. Um, and it's even easier to waste resources if you, can, if you can just fire up machines by the click of a button, right? You just click that button, you forget about it. Um, seen it happen many times. Um, another thing, and you know, another thing that, that really uh, is, makes this challenging is you, you have a lot of variables at play here. You know, maybe when you launch your app the first time, you, know, you, you look at the resource utilization, you pick the right amount of memory, you pick the right amount of CPU. But if you're like in a highly dynamic environment where you know, your traffic patterns change all the time, your apps change all the time, features get added, and, and you know, that affects how the app uses resources. And it's, it's sort of just never right, and, and you, you're kind of always playing catch up um, with all the changes that are happening. And, um, and you know, no one's really excited about doing this. I've never met anybody who like, came to work and was like, I'm going to try and save my company some money today and make sure everything's using just the right amount of resources. Just doesn't happen, and, and people just generally aren't good at this. So what's a better way of doing this? And I think, I think the, the solution is, is the same thing um, that I talked about earlier. It's, it's to you know, think about your machines as a pool of resources. Um, because what you can do then is that you can let a scheduler like Mesos um, and, and Marathon or Aurora take care of, you know, bin packing the apps onto your machines. And, you know, if you have one core left on, on this machine, it'll give it to an app that, that needs just this one core, which you'll never see happen if that allocation happens manually. It really makes scaling your cl cluster much easier because, you know, like I said, all the machines are the same. So scaling up uh, the resources for your production um, is just you just add machines to the pool. And, you know, Workloads will move to those machines automatically. Um, another nice uh, side effect of this is that um, you, get, you get a cluster level view of resource utilization. In a traditional setup with static partitioning, you kind of, you know, you can look at individual machines and look at the CPU utilization or whatever and the memory consumption. Um, but the mindset that you have is like, you know, I've already set these machines aside for this service and you kind of never look at it again. Um, but if you think about your data center as a pool of resources, like, it's very easy to, to see, like, how am I using this pool? You know, how are all of these apps combined using, using um, my data center? And um, it kind of helps with, you know, doing things like capacity planning, because you can just easily see a trend, 
across your whole data center. Um, really helps with that. It also leaves you a lot, of, lot more room for optimizations. Um, you know, like I said, um, if there's just this one CPU core available on the machine and we have an app that needs just one core, we can put it on there, um, you know, which is something that doesn't happen um, in a traditional world with static partitioning. So another big challenge, obviously, is how do we deal with failures? And there can be all sorts of failures, right? Your software can crash because you ran out of memory, or um, I think the leading cause of downtime on the internet, you run out of file descriptors. <laughs> um, you know, hardware failures also happen in the cloud, right? I mean, we're no longer racking machines in the data center, but they're still machines, and they fail. Um, so you get, still got to deal with that. Um, and there's also human operators in the cloud, and people trip over cables and, and stuff like that. So you, you see those failures even when you're running in the cloud. One thing that makes this especially challenging in the cloud is that you have little control over your maintenance windows. You know, um, I don't know who's running on AWS here, but sometimes you get an email that says, you know, we're going to take down this machine in two days. Um, move your stuff. And so, you know, it, it, it really helps when, when, you know, you don't depend on, on each individual machine. Um, so in most environments that I've seen, people get paid for this kind of stuff. You just lose one machine out of 100, and actually your app is fine. You know, things keep running, but you still get paged because you lost the machine, because it crashed, or because something ran out of memory. And people get woken up in the middle of the night um, for this kind of stuff, but it, it would be very easy to, to automate these things. So the solution is to automate it. And, you know, the first thing that you need to do there um, to automate things is you really need to, um, you need to put health checks there because otherwise you don't know when, when things break. And um, Mesos actually now has uh, built-in health checks um, so you can, you can shell out to any program um, to, do, to health check your app, lets you do pretty you know, advanced things. You can even you know, do a whole um, a workflow, walk through a couple of requests in your app and really make sure it's healthy. Um, and you know, that gets, when the health checks fail, it gets reported back to the schedulers and then you can make a decision on, on how you want to react to that. Um, most of these failures, you know, app runs out of memory or you lose a machine or whatever, it usually helps to just move this workload to a different machine for now instead of waking someone up in the middle of the night just to kind of stop the bleeding, right? Just to keep enough capacity available, keep the app running. Um, and you can really avoid most pages that way. Um, obviously, you still need to fix the app because there is a reason why it ran out of memory or out of file descriptors. You should still fix that problem. But, um, you know, if you, if you automate sort of that, that, you know, just stop the bleeding, uh, you don't wake up your guys at night, they'll be much happier, and, and you can, you know, fix the problem the next day when you're awake. So another common challenge is um, how do you package your app? Um, so if you're using Chef and Puppet, for example, um, and your deployment looks like it's like a series of steps, like 10 steps to put all sorts of different things onto a machine, each one of those steps can fail. And um, you know, some numbers that I've heard from people that, that do this kind of stuff is like, they get up to like a 5% failure rate on deploys, which is, uh, which is crazy. Um, an another problem there is really that often um, the configuration gets applied separately from, um, from the code, and, and it's not audited. So you can have failures where you, know, you have the same code running on different machines, but for some reason they have different configuration. There's no log of this, and it's really hard to debug uh, that when things go wrong. So what's the solution there? Um, I think it's immutable artifacts, um, meaning you freeze as many bits as you can before you deploy them. And you know, Docker or Linux containers in general uh, really help with that because you know, it lets you really put everything into one frozen binary image. And you know, like we heard earlier, that's in Mesos 20, so super exciting. Um, but Mesos actually supported this, this kind of uh, thing from you know, very early on. And, and before there was Docker support in Mesos, people just you know, put their apps into tarballs, or if, if they're uh, JVM apps, um, you know, they just built a fat jar and added that as a URL. Mesos would download it, and um, you know, that worked from the, from the beginning. That's still an option. Um, and the way to deal with configuration is um, to really you know, either manage it via the environment or via a version configuration store. For example, you store a, you know, a tarball of your configuration files and, and you version it. And if you're using something like Marathon um, and you do a deploy where you change the environment or you change the URLs, 
All of these changes are versioned. So, um, you know, when things do go wrong, it's, you can go in and kind of see, you know, when did the environment change and who changed it and, um, you know, helps, really helps with debugging. So, another big challenge is just how do you do deployments in, in general? Um, you know, like I said, off-the-shelf tools kind of don't work in an environment where you have hyper growth and you have new engineers joining every week and, um, and you want to deploy 20 times a day. Um, typically, the features that are missing is you don't have locking. So when you have more than a few people and, you know, you don't kind of, you don't kind of lock or sync via, via chat, um, it breaks down and you, you end up having different versions running in production. Um, there's usually, like, these tools usually don't have auditing, um, like who deployed when and what did they deploy. Um, and most of these tools work from your laptop. So, you know, God forbid the Wi-Fi goes down and, you know, half the nodes were deployed, the others weren't. And then you need to manually go in and figure out what went where. So the solution there, I think, is really um, to just do centralized deployment uh, orchestration, which is exactly what, you know, Mesos, Marathon, Aurora let you do. Um, you kind of build it into the infrastructure. You run it from a central place. Um, so, and, and that central thing takes care of, of the locking, makes sure that people don't trip over each other. Um, and so that allows you to let everybody deploy whenever they want. Um, it also keeps a log you know, of all the changes. Like I said, Marathon, for example, tracks your environment changes and your URL changes and, and whatever else. Um, also gives you a way to do a controlled rollback. So um, you know, there's a, a Marathon talk later, and um, we're going to talk about a new feature um, for deployment orchestration that also lets you roll back to an earlier version. So that really helps when things do horribly go wrong and you just need to kind of roll back. That's kind of all I had, um, you know, just some learnings and, and, and how Mesos and, and Marathon can really help with that. Yeah, the question is, should all the resources in a cluster uh, have the same properties, meaning uh, same CPU, memory, and, and so on? Um, they don't need to, but um, you know, it's, I think it's, as, as SRE, that's kind of something to, to try. Um, you know, there's good reasons for keeping different configurations, like you need, you need SSDs or, or whatever. Um, and you know, it's, that's, it's well supported by Mesos. You, know, you can you see um, the different resource characteristics. You can set attributes if you have special, special machines. But I think in general, it's just something to like, try, and, you know, try and reduce the number of, of different, different machine types. Yeah, so the, the question was, um, is a deploy kind of, does it kind of rep replace everything that's running? Um, so the way it works um, in Marathon, for example, is you do, uh, you make a request to Marathon and you say, for example, I have this um, new Docker tag that I want to deploy. And you have two parameters to control your deploy. You kind of set a minimum uh, capacity, a minimum healthy capacity. So Marathon will do health checks and, and make sure that, like, say, a certain, like, 90% of all instances of the app are healthy at all times, even during the deploy. So if your deploy goes wrong, for example, it'll stop killing old, um, you know, the old version of the app when the new version never comes up. Um, so it does, it's kind of a rolling deploy. It, you know, it kills nodes one by one and, and starts, starts the new version. So, so for a small change, it, yeah, it's so for, for any change, it does, it does a full deploy. And uh, the reason for that is, um, you know, what I mentioned with immutable artifacts. Like once you put the app onto that box, you don't, you don't want to touch it after you do that. You, you, you kind of, you want to freeze the bits before you do a deploy because that gives you a much more defined environment. So, so even small changes result in a full deploy. Yeah. So the question is, can you, can you combine different images? And yeah, so, so Docker, for example, has a workflow for that. Um, you can, you know, you can have a base Docker and, and you know, apply something else on top. Um, from Mesos' perspective or Marathon's perspective, it's really, you know, it's an image. That thing gets deployed. Um, kind of how you built that image is, is out of band. Yeah. Cool, thanks very much.